Right, good morning. And uh, I've given you the video for the two answers that we, we I asked you all to do as a homework. Uh, okay. So if you if you don't want to listen to the explanation, because basically if there's nothing much for you to, to go through, then you just pull all the way till the end. Because at the end of the video, I just display the answer. So you just want to check the answer, then just pull all the way to the end. But if you want to listen, then you just listen the whole thing, okay? All right, uh, today we're going to carry on with employment. And uh, hopefully we finish this. And uh, perhaps during the break time, right, you got to go and collect the second set of the notes. All right, I, I think they have not informed you, but it's actually ready. Okay, uh, we're going to go to page 75 right now. Now, where did we stop the last time? We talked about how do you differentiate section 13.1a as well as section 13.1b. So, we look through the two main tests. One is uh, who is the owner of the asset? Because if the ownership is given to the staff, then what you're able to do is you can sell it off, you then get the money. That's why it's 13.1a. But if, let's say, you only have an enjoyment, and enjoyment means you don't own the asset. So by the time when you resign, you don't take it with you. So what you have is just the period that you can enjoy the asset. Now, that's why it's not a form of money, okay? Now, we also talk about things like responsibility of payment, so all that we've discussed. So we're going to go now into the various uh, types of 13.1a. So we're going to see all the 13.1a now. Then we'll go into the 13.1b. Then we'll go into 13.1c. That's the main bulk of this chapter, okay? All right, uh, the first thing that I'll discuss with you in 13.1a is this thing called allowances as well as uh, reimbursement, okay? Now, you know, in, in work, it's quite normal for employer to actually uh, give you allowance. Uh, sometimes you will ask, uh, why can't my boss give me salary? For example, bosses will say, I'll give you 2,005 salary, 300 is your meal allowance, 300 is your transport allowance. So 2,005 plus 600 allowances. Now you say, why not just give me 3,001? Just call salary. I mean, what's the trouble of splitting all these into allowance and so on? Now, uh, there's actually a lot of reason why people do that in practice. And of course, most of the time it's because they try to be uh, very uh, tricky when it comes to things like increment, bonus, or even EPF. Uh, there are people who actually say that uh, the EPF is being contributed on the salary and not the allowances. So, so you just see what people are trying to do. Uh. Imagine if your salary is 2,005 plus 600. You don't have to write this, uh, okay? Compare with if your salary is 3,001. Now, if your boss say, I'm going to give you two months bonus this year. How much is your bonus? If based on the first example, it's 5,000 because that's your salary. But you see, if, I just, if I've just given you like 3,001 as everything lumped together, if your boss said, I'm going to give you two months bonus, I'm going to pay 6,002. See, they're very smart, right? Crafty. So that it might make you feel it's 3,001, but actually it is not. So in, in the future, if your boss comes and says, I'm going to give you a 30% increment. Your 30% is on 2,005. Whereas if you use 3001, it's 30% of 3001. You end up getting much more. So th that's the reason why you know people are trying to be smart. They, they try to like manipulate things. So that's why we have to deal with it like, okay, so now when it comes to tax, what do we do? Okay, we have to first differentiate what is an allowance, what is a reimbursement, okay? So you must make it very clear. Huh? What's an allowance and what's a reimbursement? Now. Reimbursement, it's basically claim. All right, reimbursement is basically claim. 
So you are told to spend on something. Then your boss say, come, give me the receipt. I'll give you back the money. That's a reimbursement. It's a claim. All right. So like your boss say, uh, go to the departmental store and buy something. Come back, pass me the bill. Now you're being reimbursed. Okay. So reimbursed is you spend first, you claim back. Now on uh, in, on the other hand, right, allowance is so different. Okay, I just need a bit of space, uh, so if you don't mind, uh, uh, so that I don't have to write so small. Okay, I'm just taking off the space. Eh? Okay, uh, whereas re uh, allowance is so different. Allowance is actually a fixed amount that your boss give it to you. It's just like salary. Okay, it's just like salary. Your boss say, nah, that's the money, take it. And the only difference with salary is like, like I've told you the actual reason is because they are trying to manipulate with how to give you bonus, how to give you increment. But, but of course, we are trying to tell you that actually when they give you allowance, they intend that the money is being spent for certain reason. Like, like your boss said, now nah, that's 300 meal allowance. That means your, your boss is hoping that this money you use it to eat is to spend for your meal. Can you not? No, but, but, but of course, is there anything wrong if I don't spend on my meal? Can my boss say, I give you meal allowance, but you never eat? It's up to me. You give me, it's my problem. I can say, no, I take the money. I want to go cyber cafe and play game. It's up to me, right? So, so and, and no, it, you don't have a control about how I spend the money, even though you may intend that I'll spend it on something. So allowance is basically a cash payment. To your staff. You pay something to your staff, a fixed amount that is intended to spend on something. Okay? So it's a fixed amount that's intended for you to spend on something. But it's up to you. Whether you, you want to spend that, you don't want to spend that, it's up to you. Okay? Now, um, so what, what we're going to see now is, so how do you treat these two things? Allowance, reimbursement. How do you treat it? Now, first we look at reimbursement first. Okay? Reimbursement. Now, the concept of taxation is very simple. The government only want to tax you because you've profited on something. Correct or not? Income tax is taxing on our income. Income is a gain. If you don't profit of, of something, then what is there for us to tax? So just remember that principle. So when you do a reimbursement, right, you must first ask yourself, what is it that you're reimbursing on? So if you reimburse, right, put inverted comment, just write there as business expense, okay? So if you reimburse business expense, Okay, think about this, huh? uh, your boss needs some stationery in the office. You happen to be in the shopping mall. So you get a call, okay? So your boss says, hey, you're in the shopping mall. Uh, help us to buy some stationery. So you go and buy all the things that you need. You come back, you pass to your boss. It was 89 ringgit. Your boss say, give me the bill. So your boss take out wallet and give you back 89 ringgit, exactly the amount that you have spent. Now my question is, did you profit out of it? You know, there's no profit, right? You, you know, you just asked me to buy something. I've used up my money. I take back. What do I gain? Nothing. So you, when, when you don't profit on anything, then am I right to say you shouldn't tax me? Now that's why when you reimburse business expense, it's not taxable. Follow? Because there's no profit element in it. Okay? There's no profit element in it. So you don't tax. Now, but it's so different. Uh, it's so different. If one fine day your boss come to you and say, you know, uh, Holiday is around the corner. Why not go get yourself some new clothes? I think like Paul. Alright. You guys say go, go, go. 
Go and buy anything you like. You like a handbag, right? Buy a new handbag. Just buy. Buy whatever you like. And give me the bill. Whoa, you know, that's a bonus day for you. Your boss said, buy anything you like and give you the bill. So you go there shopping. Buy a handbag, 500 ringgit, come back, and then you see like, you still a bit embarrassed, like, don't know true or not. Boss, you, you really give me, actually in the heart, you're very happy. Okay, boss, you really are, no la, no la. You know, you more like that. No la, no la, don't need. But actually you want. Because you know, people give you money, no la, don't need the hand already okay now so you, you tell your boss pass the bill 500 comes to you now did, did you gain in that transaction yes because that, that's your stuff you know and your boss said give me the bill and I'll pay you back that's a gain the earlier one is not because the earlier one is not your stuff you just buy on behalf of your stuff uh, of your company so that's why in this case if you reimburse something personal. Now that's a gain. So what we do? We'll tax it. Okay? We'll tax it. Okay. So what about when you get allowance? Now because allowance on its own, it's like salary. It's just an amount that I pay you for something. On its own, it's like a salary. So because it's like a salary, it becomes taxable. So all allowances will become taxable. Okay? All allowances, they're subject to tax. Okay? All allowances, subject to tax. Okay. But you're going to ask, uh, what if my boss give me an allowance, but I've used the money and spent it for work? Let, let's say I need to go for a meeting, and it involves some traveling, and my boss say, nah, I give you 200 ringgit for travel. Now, what if in the midst of the traveling, I, I truly spend 120 ringgit? So if that's the case, then you, you know you, it's so unfair you tax me the 200, but when the money is spent, for the work. Now, how, how do you address the issue? So to address the issue, they come up with an approach and say, you tax their amount first, but if they spend it on work, let them claim back. So when you claim back, the effects is there because if you get 200, if you spend 120, you minus out 120, the effect is we're taxing your profit, which is just 80, is it not? Now, so that's why even though we tax the allowance, now I'm going to leave a space first. Huh? You can then claim, now I'll call it business expense because you cannot just claim any expense. You can only claim provided that you incur it for work. So it still has to be business expense. Okay. Now, one thing that will be a little bit extra here is this. Uh, government actually wanted to See, I've told you many times that employees are generally the poor people, all right? So they, they are those that low income. You know how many percent of our, our EPF members that they are saving right now is below 50,000? About half of the members below 50,000. It is a, that, that's a, a very terrible news, you know. That means when they retire, that time, they probably only have 50,000. You know how long you can live? How long do you think you want to live after 55? 20 years? We use Mahathir as a standard. 94 this year. I, I got a joke from somebody which is quite interesting. They say at the age of 65, some of you can't even change your own pen already because you're so sick. And now we have a 94-year-old old man that is still capable of changing the whole garment. Wow, massive man. I really look at this old man. Powerful, okay? So if, you, if you're going to live up to, let's say I give you another 20 years, you live up to 75, imagine if your bank account got 50,000. You just take 50,000, divide by 20. How much you have a year? And you just divide by 12. How much you have a month? You're dead, you're dead by then, you know, because you've got no money. Man. So you're very poor. 
the side that the government knows that actually the poor people are generally the worker and and to address these issues on poverty one way is how we can relieve them from paying taxes so that they, they don't pay so much taxes that's why we ask the rich people to pay more now so what the government did was many years back uh, that was actually during the time when the petrol price was very expensive uh, I, I don't know whether you recall that petrol price shot up to 140 or 50 US dollar per barrel. That means the price of the petrol then is two and a half times of the price of the petrol now. All right, and, and government is subsidizing petrol. At that time our petrol is only one ringgit sixty cent. So the government is paying so much uh, for the petrol pumped by the people, and then government cannot take it. So that was Abdullah's time. Abdullah made a very shocking announcement over a, 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 a single day. Uh, the petrol price increased by 60 cents per litre. That, that's crazy. You, you just imagine 160 go up to 220. It's more expensive than the petrol price you're paying today, you know. And that government still pay a lot to subsidise. That was a crazy time when petrol was skyrocket high. So people are shouting and screaming, hey, how can I? We all so, you know, life is so bad. So Abdullah don't know what to do. So he announced that he, then he said, okay, okay, let's do something for, for helping you by giving you some subsidy and also give you some uh, exemption. Now, that was actually the time that the government introduced exemption to, to help reduce taxes of the people. Now, that was the history. So exemption, like example, like, I just quote a few first because we're going to see this later. Like if you have allowance meant for traveling, Okay, allowance meant for traveling. You actually get 6,000 exemption out of that allowance. Okay, so 6,000, if, if you look at it, if your tax rate is, let's say, 20%, you save about 1,002. That means you will expect you have less taxes, 100 ringgit a month. So that, that's basically like how the government trying to tell you we compensate back through reduction in your taxes. Okay, now... So that's how we deal with allowance reimbursement, okay? Now, can, can I just come to this example and then you try this? Now, we have Anthony, remuneration for year 2018. Now, he has received 11 months salary, okay? And the monthly salary is 5K. Now, there's this bonus for 2018, 3,000, which is received in December 2018. And the other 3,000 will only be paid in 2019. Now, it's based on 2018. Eh? The question is take note of the year. Eh? Now, he's given traveling allowance 9,005. Now, you see 9,005. I've just told you about exemption. So, how much is the amount that you're going to fill in? Okay. Now, the employment expenses reimbursed is 2,003. Reimbursement. But what is it that you're reimbursing? Is it for work or is it for yourself? Take note of that. Now then salary of a servant that you reimburse back from your boss, same thing. Is it for yourself or is it for work? Now Anthony spends 7,008 for business traveling purpose and the traveling allowance is purely for work. Now, so they're telling you that he actually incur 7,008 for business traveling. That, that's an expense that he incurred for work. Now, I'll just put up here and then uh, you can fill in the blanks. So we have Anthony. And it's based on year of assessment 2018. Okay? Now, uh, when you do your tax com, remember we begin off by identifying what type of income is that. So this is section 4B, this is employment. Now, and then uh, we have to further classify them according to the section 13.1. Uh, so far, these are all 13.1. We have not come into 13.1b, 13 all right, sorry, 13.1a, not 13.1b. So it's all 13.1a. Now, and uh, if you run through the description, you notice there are five things mentioned. There's uh, salary, there's bonus, Travelling allowance, employment expenses, 
reimburse and then your domestic servant so your servant salary reimburse okay now and uh, your first task now is to fill in the right figure so I've given you all the pointers that you have to take into account. Fill in the right figure. Okay. You two may need to do that. Okay. Right, so the the salary it said that eleven months were received. Now you remember the rule that we learned in section twenty five one, right? Where it says that you only assess income when what? Employment income is assessed when you received. Okay? Now so if you only receive eleven months, then you just take 11 of the 5,000 and put 55,000 into your tax comp. Now, likewise, for bonus, you will only take 3,000, the amount that you've received. Now, for traveling allowance, now remember, I've told you just now, so I've actually revealed to you, right, that we have an exemption 6,000. So that exemption basically means the government just discount it for you and say, okay, that's the amount we'll not tax. Just take it up. Okay? That's why for, for most uh, companies, what they do to help their employees to save tax is they change their, their scheme. So if they, they just divide their salary now out into traveling allowance, the staff actually will benefit out of it. So imagine if you've been getting 3,000 ringgit a month, okay, now of course 3,000 you, you don't have tax. Huh? Let's say you get 5,000 ringgit a month, you get about 60,000 a year, which then you result in some taxes, okay? Now, but if your boss say, I'm gonna give you 5,005 and 500 traveling allowance, now that would be very helpful because the 500 will become 6,000 in a year. And then the exemption of 6,000 will mean that instead of paying tax 60,000, you only pay tax based on 55. You see that? You save 5,000 because, or you save 6,000, sorry. You, instead of 60,000, you only have 54. So you save 6,000 of reduction in income. And then you save the taxes, which employers should do all that. Okay? Because why employer must help the staff to save the taxes? So you don't pay so much salary, yeah. You, you, know, you know, sometimes people will say, hey, my, my company, I work, I get 3000 a month, you know. Well, your company only pay 3000 So little. Uh. Yeah, but you're parking one day 15 ringgit. My parking here free, you know. So if you park 15 ringgit a day, if you park 20 days, you also pay 300 man. I don't have to pay, I save what? Can you see, you know? Then you got to walk to the shopping mall and eat, you know? Your chicken rice there, for example, uh, is 9 ringgit 50 to 12 ringgit. My chicken rice in the canteen probably only 5 ringgit 50 cents. You see, no? Or 6 ringgit. So that, 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 that's these kind of things that we should always bear in mind. That's why bosses will have to work hard to see how to improve the welfare of the staff by saving their taxes. Uh, so you have to think about all that. Right? How you can introduce a scheme 
that will result in lower taxes for the staff, which benefit them and benefit you. Then you tell them, see, I don't have to give you so much pay rise because you save your taxes. Now, so the, the first part on the traveling allowance, after the exemption, you only have 3,005. Okay, do you tax employment expenses reimburse? Good, all right, you don't tax. Uh, I just put zero. I always use the right name, but computer now we just type zero, okay? Okay, the salary of the domestic servant reimbursed. Do you tax this? Yes, because that's something for yourself, okay? So 4001 comes in. Alright, so what is the amount that we have here? Let's just total up. 60? 65,006. Okay, what do you call 65,006? Gross. What we're doing now is the gross, but the gross is made up of many things. So remember, this is called gross income. Okay, now and again, when we learn our tax com, right after gross, what do you do? Deductible expenses, so you get what? Adjusted, not yet statutory, you get adjusted, okay? Now, that's why right after gross, you're supposed to bring in the deductible expenses. Okay, now the issue is, do you have deductible expenses in the example? Yes. Anthony said he spent 7000 a for business traveling. Okay? Spent 7000 a for business traveling. Now, uh, of course, what we'll see is, uh, you will say, okay, then what, what do we do with 7,008? You probably say, let's claim it. Now, I want to highlight the issue here is, before we claim, we have to take out that 6,000. Now, you probably say, like, why? I mean, what's that 6,000? Now, the 6,000 is taken off because the government says that I've given you an exemption of 6,000. So when it comes to deduction, you will also take the 6000 out so that you will not be able to claim on that same amount. That was the whole idea. Now, wait, wait first, I know you probably will say, then what's my benefit? You know, you tell me 6000 up there, you exempt me. Then down here, you say I cannot claim the 6000 or so, so that at the end, I only claim 1008 You know, you will actually get the same answer. If you say 9,005 minus 7,008, you get the same total. So that's why some people say that I don't understand what the government is doing. Why do you say this benefit me? Why do you say help me? It doesn't help me. It's the same, right? Now, that, that's because in this case, it looks like that. Now, let me give you another example. Anyway, that's my adjusted income. Okay? Now, because employment will not get capital allowance. Okay? Employment does not get capital allowance. Now, what gets capital allowance? Only business. So in that case, I, why do I write business? In that case, this figure will become your statutory. Okay? Now, whatever example I'm giving here looks like the, the exemption does not benefit us. Alright? It looks like it does not benefit us. But I, I want to give an example that it will benefit you. And, and that's exactly the intention of what we're trying to do. So imagine, uh, I'm using the same figure. Imagine I'm using the same figure. 9, 5 minus 6 is 3, 5. But, don't, don't change, uh, okay? But, your actual business traveling, even though your boss gives you up to 9,005, your actual business traveling is only 2,003. So because of the exemption of 6,000, you don't minus anything at all. So 3,5 minus nothing, the figure is 3,5. Okay? If you don't have an exemption, the figure would have been 9,005. And their expense would have been 2003. And the amount would have been 7002. So compare this figure with this figure. You've actually saved. Okay? You've actually saved. So that's why 
that, that's how it works. Okay, that's how it works. So it's actually intended for those people that you will get an exemption when your traveling is not so much for business. So that, you, you know, by right, you can't claim anything. But at least the exemption help you to take off 6000 from your income. So I hope you see that. Okay? Okay, so that's the first part to explain to you how do you differentiate allowance and reimbursement. Okay, uh, let's go on to another 13.1a income, which is called subsidized taxes. All right? Now, subsidized taxes uh, can be kind of complicated sometimes. But in exam, we, we don't see them to be so complicated. Okay? Uh, I just give an example like if your boss is paying your taxes, and then if that year is it happens to be your final year that you're in the country, then how do we deal with that? Now later you understand why I say that. Okay. Now the whole idea of subsidized taxes is basically you have employer paying your taxes. Your employer is paying your taxes. So when your boss is paying your taxes, it becomes a perquisite because you save your money. Okay? You save your money. Now, but we have a problem with timing. Okay, we have a problem with timing. See, why, why do you say problem with timing is because when you have your, your taxes, you always find that your taxes that you're paying for that particular year is actually taxes for the preceding year, the year before that. Now, it's like uh, the income of year of assessment 20, 2018, right? You will only declare in 2019. See that? that that's a year delay, right? This is income of 2018. You declare in 2019. You, you know, this is now the time where most employees will have to start busy about declaring their taxes again. Because we have a due date up to 30th April. Now it's the uh, end of February. So by next month and the following month, that, that's the two months. Now, of course, we do have some extension in practice. Lah, but, you know, April is that busy month. All right? That people start to, to get all their information and then they will go and report the income to Inner Renew. But when they report the income, they report income of which year? Last year. We are in 2020, but they are reporting income of last year. So the taxes that you will pay this year is taxes of last year income. So it's always a year delay. Now, because of that issue, think, think about that. Your boss say, I'll pay the taxes. I'll settle it for you. Now, because your boss paying the taxes, imagine your boss tell you that this April, I'll settle it for you. Now, your boss is actually paying taxes for last year. But the benefit is this year. So don't, don't get it confused like because it's taxes of last year, then how do we treat it? It's a benefit of this year because your boss pay this year. Now that's why if you have income taxes of 2016, for example, you will notice that when your boss pay for you, you will actually include it in YA17. Because the taxes of 2016 will only be known in 2017, there's always a year delay. Now, I'm going to use this example to explain to you. Okay, Veronica is employed by Polo. Her income taxes would be paid by Polo, okay? So that's what we see. Taxes will be paid by the employer. Now, let's start with 2017. She's paid an annual salary of 120000 and and it's fully received in 2017. She also received 10,000 allowance for traveling. Now, the income tax for 2016 was 16,000 and is paid by Polo on 10 April 2017. See, see the fact? It's taxes of 2016, but it's paid in 2017. So, what do you do then? Then you have to take this amount. 
show as an income of Y18. Okay? Then it goes on with 2018 and says that uh, Polo promoted Veronica in January 2018. And then uh, given her a pay rise of 2005 and the traveling allowance is substituted with reimbursement of actual traveling expense, she claims 17.7 for her business trip. Polo also paid her a bonus of 10,000 in March 2018, which relates to 2017's employment. Okay, Veronica contribute EPF at the rate of 11% on both salary and bonus. And SOXO is at half a percent of the salary. Now, so that, that's what it says, okay? Now, that what, what is the tax liability that she has to pay in 2017 and 2018? Now, let's just do this together. Now, I'll do the 2017 first. Okay, then I, I will get you to go on with 2018, all right? Okay, uh, I'm not sure if I need two columns, so I'll just prepare the space. Like if I need, I'll use it. If not, just leave it there. Okay. Now we'll begin off with four B employment, and again now we are having our thirteen one A. Okay, so I'll just do for 2017, and I'll leave extra space for you, you know, in case you need to fill in the rest of the detail. All right, now uh, we have salary for Veronica that is uh, 120,000, and then uh, there's also traveling allowance. But remember, we have the exemption of 6,000, so it's 10 minus 6, so it becomes 4. Right then, based on what it says, the income taxes paid by the employer. So this is the income tax subsidized for 2016, but it's paid in 1.7. The tax is only known in 1.7, so the amount will be... 16,000. Okay? So as far as uh, 2017 is concerned, that's my figure. Now I will have this as my gross. Right, with no other detail, eh? so that's my adjusted statutory aggregate and total income. So this will be 140. Right guys, then we have uh, tax relief. Now there's a personal deduction 9,000. Okay, from questions I know that there will be EPF with the salary so high you will surely hit the maximum of 4,000. And then uh, they tell me that the, the SOXO is half a percent of the salary. Now that will come to about 600, so which then you have hit the maximum of 250. Uh, it's only an example uh, because we, 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 in real life we don't use percentage for SOXO. Okay? SOXO has a table that you just have to refer to a table and then they'll come to one point that your, your SOXO is maximum. It will just stop there, regardless of how much your salary. Okay, It's not like EPF, it's not like you earn one million a month means you, you get a very huge SOXO. No, okay? But, but it's only for the example sake that I, I just put half a percent. Okay, so uh, what is my chargeable income for 2017? Let's see. So one four zero okay, 
Okay, I have one, two, six, seven, five, zero. Okay. All right, now that's the CI. And of course, from there, you can work out the taxes. Now that's 2017. Then you can go on with 2018. Now I've, I've shown one part for you. So I just want you to carry on and finish off 2018. So give you a few minutes, just uh, proceed on with the numbers. Just reflect on the additional information and fill in the blank with the right view. It's not the travelling allowance. They say that they will replace it with the reimbursement of the actual business travel. There is not an allowance. So those of you who minus 6,000, that's not right. Because that's an allowance. You're not reading it properly. Okay. Alright, uh, let's just try this. Okay, I, I noticed most of you are okay with the salary that you have... Uh, Bring it up to 150,000 as a result of the pay rise, okay? Now, uh, you then see they say that the allowance is substituted with a reimbursement of the actual traveling. So, when you do a reimbursement of, now, it, it's business traveling. That means the traveling is for work. So the right thing you do is, it's a zero. You, you cannot tax it. Okay? So for those of you who have minus 6,000 and put that 11,700 there, that, that's not right. That means you have actually 
you, you didn't actually differentiate between an allowance and a reimbursement, which is what we have just explained earlier. Okay, so take note of that. Huh? That's that's a mistake I see. Okay, then uh, uh, okay, there's a bonus that they mentioned, which is ten thousand. That's that's okay. That's okay. Now, one part that I, I'm silent in 2018, but I expect um, you guys will actually realize that and pick it up. It's the taxes for YA17. See, in 2017, the boss is paying taxes of 2016. So in 2018, the boss will pay taxes at 2017. Of course, I didn't give you the figure because I expect you to compute it yourself. So you actually expected to do this. Like on the first 100k. How much is the tax for the first 100k? 10,900. Thank you. And then for the rest of 26, how much is the tax? 20. 4%. Do you have the figure, Chad? 6,420. Now, so that will be 17,320. Now, that, that's basically the tax that you're going to pay for this 126,000. And the boss said, I'll pay that. But of course, that will happen in 2018. That's why. This 17,320 will come back in 2017. See that? Okay? So you, you always have that cascading effect. Like this year, when your boss paid the tax, it will flow down to the next year, and the next year flow down to the, the following year, and so on, right? Okay. And uh, what about if this is the year you you resigning and you're leaving the country? Which I don't intend to discuss with you, but I'm just trying to tell you that's why we have more issue. You see, because if the tax of 2017, you add in 2018. 2018, you add in 2019. What if 2019 is your last year? And then your boss say, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to pay the tax of that last year. And by right, you're supposed to take the taxes in 2019 and add to 2020, right? But you don't have a 2020 because you're no longer in the country. Then how? That one don't tax. Uh. That, that's why we have some issues here. And then if you actually learn more into all these, then you realize that uh, in 2019, your taxes will be computed two times, where they will take these taxes in 2019 to, to work out the tax of 2020 as if you're a non-resident, then they add it back. So th this is all some complication, which I, I don't intend to bring in for you, but I'm just trying to tell you that actually there are a lot more complications uh, depending on the situation. But ours is quite straightforward. Uh. That like this is what we know, okay? This amount go on to next year. That's all, okay? Okay. Uh, so what is my gross? One seven seven three two. Now then you have the same amount of tax relief two five zero. Then you have your chargeable. Can I just leave you with the taxes? Just work it out yourself, lah, okay? All right, now, so I hope you understand how we deal with subsidized taxes. Huh? So that's to do with subsidized taxes. Okay, please turn to page 76 now of your notes. Okay, now the exemption for various allowances that I've said to you earlier. So I'm going to like basically list down here and tell you what kind of exemptions that we have. Okay, uh, just take note of the heading. Uh, for traveling, right, 
you get 6,000 a year, which I've explained to you, okay? 6,000 a year, okay? We have child care allowance, all right? We have child care allowance. Now, you have to differentiate child care allowance with child care benefit. If it's a benefit, it comes under 13.1D, okay? If it's a benefit, it's 13.1D. If it's allowance, it's 13.1A. Now, allowance is cash. Okay, allowance is cash. So I can do this example. Uh, if, if let's say this is my company, I can do a policy like that. I can say, uh, if any of our staff, if you have a child that the age is 12 years and below, right? Uh, every month, we will give you extra 200 ringgit. You say, why? It's just an extra allowance for you uh, to send your child to your, 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 your kindergarten or child care center. It's just to, to help you. You get an extra 200, okay? So it becomes a policy that we can introduce for those who have children, an extra child care allowance. Now, child care benefit, on the other hand, is the child care comes from your boss. It's not money. Okay, just imagine like you're working with MCKL, okay? Now, let's say we operate a childcare at that building that the other end there, we, we have one building that there's a childcare center that is under the maintenance of the college. That means it's, it's ours. We take care of it. We pay for all the expenses. Everything is from us. Now, and now we are telling all our staff, if any one of you has children, feel welcome to send your kids there. You know, you just go there and show your card that, oh, I'm MCKL, and, and, and then you just pack your children there. You don't have to worry about paying anything. It's just like going panel cleaning and see doctor. Only. Just go and come back. The children is there. Don't have to pay. It's all taken care by us. Now, that's a child care benefit. If I give you money and then you go and look for your own child care and then you pay for your own pocket, that, that's not benefit. That's and allow it, okay? So you must differentiate. Now, of course, child care benefit is different because it gets full exemption. Okay, it gets full exemption. It's a very good thing. All right, it's a very good thing. We, we always recommend to, you know, employers when we do consultancy, we tell them that uh, run or operate a child care for the staff because most parent, actually not parent, most mum, because father usually don't have that feeling, right? but the mum will have that feeling. A lot of mothers, they are always caught in a situation that they have to divide between work and family. And the biggest main issue with them is always when they have young children, like, you know, two years old, three years old. They, they really feel very bad that they have to leave the, the, the baby or their toddler aside and then go to work. And then they may not feel safe also. So if you have a childcare center, you really, really make your, your staff feel so at peace that, you know, my child is so near to me. During lunchtime, you, you just imagine the joy during lunchtime. Instead of going out for lunch, you can drop by at a childcare center, peep a bit at your child, and then continue to go to work. So, so you find that it's, it's marvelous. Employer can do this to hold the hearts of their employees. And, and you get loyalty from that. You go and survey uh, how many employer in this country that has a childcare center. So you one day you become an employer, take note of that. It, it's a very, very important family thing that you will get the best out of your staff because of that. Your staff probably will stay on for many years just because they know that children is being taken care of. Okay? And it's so expensive, you know. You know, if I want to send my child for a childcare, how much will it cost me a month? What do you think? Send a child, let's say you have a three, four year old child. The younger the child, the more expensive uh, because very hard to take care of. One month. If let's say take care for you one whole day until you finish work, come back, pick up. 
1,000, yeah, around there. 800, 900, 1,000. So imagine your salary, 3,000, 1,000 is gone. So you can always do this. Tell your, your worker, I'll pay you 2,005 instead of 3,000. But I got a childcare for you. Then you attract all the parents. I mean, the mum to, to come and work and die for you. You see, not such a good strategy, right? All right? But a lot of them don't do it, okay? So it's very sad. So take note of that. It will help you next time when you become your boss. Now, the, the thing here about childcare allowance eh, is allowance, right, will get an exemption, but only up to 2004. Whereas benefit is a full exemption, which is better. So you must differentiate the two, eh? okay? Now, the exemption for childcare allowance is given on the basis that you must have a child, which I think makes sense that like you got no child, then what childcare allowance do you want, right? Because, you know, you must have a child and the child must be 12 and below. I mean, again, it doesn't make sense. You tell me your child is 35 years old and you still want childcare allowance for what? You know? So that's why this is the main thing that is meant for those who have children, okay? Now, uh, there's also exemption for parking, all right? Exemption for parking, parking allowance. There's also exemption for meal allowance, all right? Parking allowance, meal allowance. Now, because this is a bit uh, tricky, so it's very hard for the government to strike a balance. Example, if you work in KL City, you know, your parking costs four, five hundred ringgit a month. But if you work in those uh, big kampong area like in Portison, your parking probably may only cost about 50 ringgit a day or probably it's free some more. So, so end of the day, we have a problem about setting an exemption. Because there are people that the parking is really expensive. There are people that parking is not so expensive. Now, that's why here it says the parking allowance is given full exemption, but condition is it has to be reasonable. All right? It has to be reasonable. So that is why if, let's say, MCKL... It's trying to, like, I told you, they're trying to help the staff to save taxes. They say, okay, uh, let's give our staff a 300 ringgit traveling allowance. Let's give our staff a meal allowance. Let's give our staff a parking allowance. Now, that's not reasonable. Why? Because parking here is free, man. The staff enjoy a free parking. You already don't pay parking. What parking allowance you want to give people? Now, that, that sounds unusual. So, that's why... In that, in that case, right, the inland revenue will challenge you. That's why you, you cannot simply do one. You, you must ask yourself, like, do you really need to give this allowance or not? Okay? So, and, and it has to be fair and reasonable. Now, likewise, for meal allowance, it has to be fair and reasonable. All right? Which, again, is very hard to set a standard because, you know, if I send you to Australia... You know, part of your work is to tr fly to Australia and do work. You know how much you're going to spend for work? I mean, for food. Their, their Coca-Cola could be five Aussie. Then their food one meal could come to Ringgit Malaysia 100 plus. So if I give you a meal allowance, even if I say meal allowance 500 Ringgit a day, it's not excessive because you're talking about exchange rate. I mean, Australia is expensive food. Does that end, end of the day, you have to judge all that into account to decide what is reasonable and what is not, okay? Okay, uh, all these are the allowances that will be given exemption. Now, I have a small note here and say, actually it's not small, it's very big, okay? That director of a controlled company will not get all these exemptions. Now, can I come back to the meaning later on? Like, what do you exactly mean by director of controlled company? But I want to highlight to you is... They do not get all these exemptions. They will not enjoy. The, go the government just say no. Okay? Alright, let's just come to page 77. Okay, what other things that fall under 13.1a? Alright, now uh, we have this thing called club membership. Alright, club membership. Uh, there are a lot of companies that actually has club membership for the staff, but you must differentiate the way that they offer club membership. You know, like example, if you work with a bank, eh, a lot of banks actually have a club membership that they are meant for the staff. 
let's say I work with M Bank, you know, I uh, M Bank stuff. So this is my M Bank card. Okay, so if I got M Bank card, then I can go to our club that belongs to M Bank. But because I'm a staff, right? The moment I show, I can just walk in and enjoy the facility. But when this card is taken back from me, that means I'm, I'm no longer a staff of M Bank. Can I still walk in? Cannot. Meaning, I don't have the club. You see that? I only have what? What's the word? Enjoyment. I only enjoy the facility when I'm still a staff. So in that case, that club is 13.1b. Okay? Which I actually repeat it here later on. Uh, you, you can see uh, in page... It's quite far away. 85. A corporate club. That's that's what we call a corporate club. And now we are looking at personal club. Now, personal club is very different. Personal club is your boss actually signed up a club under your name. Okay, so your boss say, come, I, I get you a golf club. Okay, then your boss buy the club using your name. That, that means you're registered as the owner of the club. You know, the day you resign from the company, the club is yours. It's yours. And, and you can sell the club membership because club membership is very expensive. Especially those very prestigious, high class where all the elites are there. And they're very expensive because people use all these like, club to network to know people, to get business contract and stuff like that, okay? Now, so do take note. If the club is personal club, then it's A, because it's yours. You don't want the club, sell it. You can sell the club, all right? That's why there are people who buy club membership like investment uh, those days, like crazy, you know, because you know, okay? So it's very hard to sell one because at the end of the day, you got more and more clubs, all right? Just like there are people who actually, especially Chinese, they, they invest in what the dead people plot. You know, the, the land, the, the, the burial plot. They go and buy, uh, thinking that like property, a lot of people buy property because they say next time property houses will go up. Then they say people dead already, uh, they need a place to, to bury themselves. So they go and buy the plot to invest also. What kind of mentality we all have? I don't understand. Dead people, so you want to make profit out of it. So go and buy and invest and keep for the value to go up. You can see, you know? But I think this is nonsense, man. You go and buy the, the, the land and keep and you expect the value to go up when there are more and more land opening up. How can the value goes up when there's plenty of supply? You go and see some money, the mountain so big. So at the, at the end of the day, there will always be available supply. So whatever you buy, you cannot sell. One, okay? Then keep for themselves. Now, so those who buy two or three plots and don't know what to do with it. Okay. Now, so the the thing here is this is personal club, nah? personal. Take take note, nah? personal. Now, when you join a club, right? Now remember, uh, there are two payments you're gonna make. One is called the entrance fee. So entrance, it's actually the 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 fixed amount that you pay the lump sum when you wanna join. It's like buying the club like that. It could be like one shot. You have to pay fifty thousand. That, that's an entrance fee. Now then, every year, the club will charge you subscription. So like every year, you have to pay uh, 2004 or 3006 so you just keep paying subscription. Now, so both amount will be paid by your, your boss because your boss is giving it to you and both amount are fully taxable. Okay? Now that's to do with club. Okay, go on. Huh? Okay, uh, now we are looking at utility. All right? that bosses are settling for you. So if you read the description here, we say, these are utility bills registered under the employee's name. The bills registered under your name, but the employer settles bill on your behalf. That's it. Your, your boss is settling bill on your behalf. So I put up on the note there, right? You can see on the screen. Uh, this is an electric bill. Okay, it's a very typical electricity bill that you get every month. Now, you notice uh, the bill, right? 
printed on the bill was the name of that person called Siti Jamila. So now I, I got a staff called Siti. Okay, so I got a staff called Siti. Siti is employed by XYZ. And the boss said, hey, come bring your electric bill and I will settle it for you. So the electric bill is paid by the boss. Now, this amount that your boss is paying for you, you will have to take it as 13.1a. Understand why? If your boss don't settle this bill, tell me what you're going to do with the bill. You pay yourself, right? I mean, that's your bill, right? Your boss don't settle, you pay yourself. Your boss doesn't actually need to settle, but your boss is being nice to you and say, come, give me the bill. So that's why, if your boss don't settle, you're supposed to pay. But now because your boss is paying for you, you save that money. Your wallet got extra 99 ringgit. That's why you tax it. Okay, so take note. Huh? Now, but I want to highlight this thing to you now. That there are certain utilities are actually given exemption. Okay, there are certain utilities that are actually given exemption. Now, what are they that are given exemption? Exemption, huh? Now, you will be exempted the line and the hardware. Okay, the line as well as the hardware, all right? Now, and the exemption will only be one each, okay? The exemption will only be one each. So it's setiap satu. So all these things, you get one exemption each. Now, what do you get the exemption? Now, you get exemption for your telephone. Now, telephone, it's the landline. Okay, so it's a very old law. Uh, their mentality is you are, you are having the landline that you plug onto the wall. And that, that's called telephone. Now, then you have mobile phone, which technically is mobile phone. So if you have a wireless one, it's a mobile phone. Okay, so you've got a SIM card, it's a mobile phone. So you say, if I got telephone and mobile phone, what if I don't want telephone? I want two mobile phones. Then you only have one exemption. Telephone is telephone, mobile phone is mobile phone. Okay, so you have telephone, mobile phone. Now, you then have broadband as well as pager. Okay, pager is a very old thing. Right? I don't even know if... Have you even seen a pager in your life? God, have you seen a pager in your life? That, that day here... I don't know how the, 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 they are spring cleaning the college. The library is cleaning. The bookshop is cleaning. Then, clean, 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 they found a stack of CD. The CD is a video magazine of the vision that they had many years back that they put it up in CD. So, the, the staff was asking me, Mr. Lau, you want to know? I give it to you. You take and use it and keep it as a souvenir. So, I took the CD. Then I look at her, I say, I don't know where to play. I don't have player for, I realize I don't have a, a, a DVD player or VCD player anymore. My computer don't even have a CD player also. So I just realized that I got a CD, but it's so useless. So funny, you know, you know, things has changed so much. Those days, everything is like CD, CD. People get so excited when you give people CD, all right? And now CD is gone, okay? So I don't know whether you've seen a pager. A pager is a small... A uh, small box, I, mean, I won't call box, a square thing gadget like a credit card size with a screen. Okay? So what you do in pager is like that. Those days, because handphone very expensive, man. You know when handphone started, uh, uh, my, my dad used to have one Motorola and Nokia. Well, that, that time, if you hold the handphone, you're you, you very action and you're very proud. One, because the cost of a handphone uh, is about 15,000 to 12,000 ringgit. That's why nowadays you're saying Apple expensive. You think back where it got expensive, it's so cheap because it's only 4,000. Those days when you have a handphone, uh, you buy second-hand handphone, trade in one, uh, also about easily six, seven thousand ringgit. So what they do those days, the handphone is like the water bottle one. 
So they always carry the handphone in the trousers uh, to, to, to show the antenna. So if this is your, your trousers, uh, okay, this is your trousers. So you just want to show the antenna only. Uh, so you walk around with the antenna, all right? So people say, wow, I got handphone one. That time, one month, uh, the phone bill uh, is about four, five hundred ringgit. Because you make one phone call, uh, one phone call can come to three, four ringgit. Uh. So what we do, we play miss call. Uh, you won't know all these things. Uh, because those days so expensive. Those days our SMS is so expensive. One SMS started with 60 cents, you know. And how many characters we can type? About 140 something only. Or, or one, about one, 100, 160 characters. So that's why we learn how to cut our words so short. Né? That we can squeeze everything in 160 over character and people can understand. Né? Okay, so that, that was our day. All right? But anyway, it's not important. All right? it's, it's all past. Okay? So pager were famous that time because phone very expensive. So you cannot reach a person. So they come up with a very cheap way. So we subscribe to a service called Pager Service. So there's a code one. So my code, let's say my code is 103. So you call this number and you say, I want to page 103. Now then you tell the person my message. So you're given a short message. You must say, what do you want? Uh, come for a meeting at 1 p.m. You say like that, okay? Then the pager company will send the message to the pagers. Then my pager, do, 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 just see. Uh, come meeting, one pay, uh, then I got your message. Now, or call back the phone number, then I see call back, uh, then I must go and look for what? Public phone. I don't even know whether now you still see public phone. Uh, those days, public phone. Public phone, those days, uh, is, is our our memory during our young time because when we want to chase girl, uh, you never you you never call from your house phone. Uh, because your house phone is so expensive, you make phone call, you're dead, man. Your mom will take the beer and say, wow, why 30 ringgit one phone call? What, who do you call? So we want to still, still call. How do we churi, churi call? We're going to stand at the bus stop to wait for the public phone. And then there'll be this one lady stand there and talk like the phone is forever hers. One. Because you're not going to be waiting so long. And then you just go turn around the, the, the circle uh, to show your face that you're waiting. You turn and turn and turn. And then she's very funny. Uh. She'll look at you, turn, then she'll look at the other side. You see, uh? And then you turn and then she'll look at the other side. They don't care, man. Uh. Uh, but that's our life, uh, okay? You never experienced that, right? Uh, okay? Different type of uh, 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 so-called life hood that we have, okay? Now, that's pager. And I find it so funny that the law actually included pager, which I don't know who actually has it. I don't even know whether we still have pager company now or not. So our law is so outdated. Now, so exemption is given for one of these things. Each one. So you can have one telephone, one mobile phone, one broadband, and one pager. Now, the, the exemption goes with hardware, you know, which is a good thing. So your boss can give you an iPhone that's worth 5,000 ringgit, man, and you still get exemption. Because exemption is given for one line and hardware. Now, but you say, what if my boss give me two? Now, then you, you must choose which one you want to exempt. So if you say, I get two phone. With two handphone line, you choose one. Okay? So one each. Alright, now carry on. Eh? Education. Uh, basically, we are saying employer is paying your education. Okay? For your children. Alright? For your children. Now, I, I put in bracket that if your employer is paying it for you, that, that's very different. If employers say, I'm paying for your own study, now then you should look at that as a scholarship. Okay? If your boss say, I'm paying for your own study, that, that's a scholarship. Alright? And I'll come to that later so that you don't get mixed up between a scholarship and a, a bond, which is a very different thing. Now, this is paying for what? For your children. Okay, and what will we do when your boss is paying for your children? Well, just tax it under 31A, the amount of cost fee that your boss is paying. Okay, uh, then we're going to see the next one, which is in page 78, but the illustration is 77. Now, let's just come to 78. Okay, we are talking about insurance. If boss provides free insurance 
to the staff. Okay, if your boss provide free insurance to your staff. Okay, now uh, it, it's actually very important to ask ourselves that when you're given an insurance, right, who will benefit? So it's important to see if employees, family, or their appointed nominees are the beneficiary, then it's a benefit to you. Okay? Now, if let's say the employer themselves will benefit, then, then actually there's no benefit. All right? If the employer is a benefit, that, then there's no benefit because it doesn't benefit you. So take note of it. Now, I'm going to use this example here, page 77, to, to just highlight it to you, like, to, to get an idea. You, you know, when you buy insurance, there's always one form that you'll be asked to fill in. Is when I die, who gets the money? Your EPF needs to do that. All right, you must go EPA and do nomination so that when you die, who gets the money? And the law is such that, you know, the EPF nominees cannot be through your will. So you cannot leave a will and then cannot, you have to go through the EPF and do it. That's why it's very uh, secure. So that's the reason why you, you must go to EPF and do it, all right, and set it there, all right, and write properly. And every time after you do the nominee, EPF will send a letter to your house and say, this is what you have agreed and changed. Now, that's very important because there are a lot of people uh, when they change this uh, name, uh, they don't want to let people know. Because, you know, like for example, uh, you, you wanted to leave your money for your son and not for your wife. So you quietly, secretly go to EPF and change it. You change it, put your, your son name, 100%, wife don't have anything. Then EPF will send a letter to your house. Then your wife will receive the letter and say, hey, KWSP, your name, out of curiosity and care for you, your wife will open up the letter. And your wife will see, wow, my name disappeared. Wow, all go to the sun, habis. You did, you did. You can say, no, ah. So that's why if you really want to change all that, be very smart, change address first. So that the letter don't go home, go to your office or go anywhere. Okay, very practical. You know? A lot of people, they don't understand all that. So we must teach them and tell them, you know, this is what will happen. So you must do this step before you do this step and do this step. So some people, they don't think so much. Huh? They just change it. Then that's it. End of the world, world War Five. Now, so imagine when you buy insurance, you, you ask to fill in this nomination, which basically is beneficiary. Now, you, you just read what it says there. In the event of my death, I would like any lump sum benefit due from the scheme to be paid in this follow so, so you will actually write down how you want the money to be paid out. Now, example, uh, example. Goodyear is buying an insurance for the staff called Aming. Uh. Sorry? Okay, so when, when you fill in the nomination, you actually write down like if anything happens to you, who gets the money? So I'm just trying to give you an idea that if la, if Aming, right? Aming is a staff, ma. The insurance is, is bought by the employer. And then the, the boss tell you, write whatever name you like. Ah. So Aming put there, Aming wife. Okay? Wife. All right? And get 100% of all the money. Now, so in that case, will you call this as a benefit? Of course, what? Because if you die, the money goes to your wife. I mean, that's a benefit, right? Now, then you tax it. Because anything that comes as a benefit, tax it. But do you know that they are, they are insuring that when they buy, they don't buy with that intention that money goes to your, your own people. Now, it's like Goodyear say, I'm going to buy you an insurance. If anything happens, the money goes to Goodyear. 
the company. 100%. I don't like this side insurance because I say if my boss buy like that, my boss every day curse me to die. Alright? Especially business not good. Die, business not good. Die, die, die. You can say not, okay? Now, but, but we have this kind of insurance. It's very normal for very senior staff. We call it as key man insurance. Okay? It's called as key man insurance. Now, the purpose of a key man insurance is because if anything happens to the leader of the company, you, you know, there will be very bad impact to the business. You know, look at Malaysia, for example. Uh, because of the last two days, all the fiasco about who is going to lead the country. Basically, Malaysia got no CEO already, right? Because the prime minister is gone. Okay? You know what's the impact? You look at our stock market. Do you know the, the very Monday, uh, when the stock market opened, right? How bad the market has crashed? 44 billion ringgit gone. 44 billion gone. One day. Because of not having that person there. You see, no? So that's the issue. That, that's why the loss of an important person, it can be very devastating to a company. That's why they buy insurance to protect the business. In case if anything happened to you, the business gets something. Okay. Now, But from our point of view is, if the beneficiary is the staff, then it's taxable. If beneficiary is the employer, then it's not taxable. So that, that's how you need to recall and relate to this. Okay? Okay, let's turn to the next page. Now, we're going to see issues concerning advancement of loan. So what happened now is we have employer lending money to the staff. So there's loan given to the staff. Now, what is important now is when you get a loan from your boss, right? Now, you, you have to differentiate if this money come from your boss's own money or your boss borrow from a bank and lend it to you. Now, we normally call this as internal fund and this is an external fund. So our concept is when the fund is internal fund, it's basically no cost, uh, which is not true. I know from management point of view, how can there be no cost? There's opportunity cost. Okay, but we are talking about it doesn't really cause you to pay anything because the money is there. Now, but if you borrow from a bank, then you have to pay, you see. So there is a cost. To the boss or to the bank. Uh, sorry, to the employer. To the to the boss or to the employer. Now the treatment. So when boss give you a loan using their extra spare cash in the company, the treatment is, is not taxable. Now the reason why it's not taxable is because we see that there is no gain. Alright, there's no gain since there's no cost. If there's no cost to the employer, you, you don't gain anything. You don't save anything. Alright? But when the loan is taken from an external source and give it back to you, right? Now, then it will actually be taxable. Okay? It will actually be taxable. Now, but what do you tax? We tax the subsidized interest. Okay? 
okay, will tax the subsidized interest. Now, I'll come to what subsidized interest later. Okay, but before we talk about taxing the subsidized interest, now, we're going to see this. We're going to see what is the purpose of the employee taking the loan. Why, why do you borrow this money from the company or from your boss? Now, because if you say that the reason you borrow the money is to either buy a house or buy a car or pay for your own study. Now, it has to be very specific and it must be a house, not a land, not a shop lot, okay? It must be a car, not a lorry, not a van, not a motorbike, okay? So you're buying a car, a house, and it has to be for your own study, not for your children's study, your own, all right? Now, if you are using the loan that you borrow from your company for that, good, you get an exemption. Now, if no, then there is no exemption. Now, example, uh, you use it for your wedding. All right, you borrow money because you need it for your wedding. Now, then sorry, there's no exemption. Okay, so when you have an exemption, the next thing we're going to ask is, how much is the exemption? Now, it depends on the loan amount that you borrow. So if the loan amount that you've got from your boss is 300000 or lesser, good, you've got full exemption. But if the amount you borrow is more than 300000 right, you have to use a formula. We say the A, B, C formula that will give you the exemption value. Okay, the A, B, C formula will give you the exemption value. Okay, now I want to discuss with you how do you get that formula and how do you get this thing called interest subsidy. So can I bring you to page 79, just turn to 79. Okay, now first thing is, how do you get interest subsidy? Now, the subsidized interest is the cost to your boss, the amount of interest that your boss has to pay, minus the amount that you get back from the staff. That means the interest that the staff has to pay. So your boss paid 5000 to the bank. You pay back 4000 to your boss. You save 1000 that's the subsidy, okay? So this is how we get subsidy. Now, exemption. The same thing that I've explained to you earlier in the chart, I mentioned to you the purpose of the loan. I mentioned to you the amount of the loan. Now, I want to discuss with you. Take note, eh? if the principal loan amount exceeds 300000 eh? Because if the amount is 300000 or lesser, it's fully exempted. You don't need to bother by any formula. It's only when the amount is exceeding 300, then you must use this ABC formula to work out the exemption. Now, what is A? A is the interest subsidy. Take note, huh? A is the subsidized interest. Now, B, okay, usually B is where the, the mistake comes in. It's the lower of the loan balance, the outstanding amount of 300,000. Okay, the lower of the loan balance of 300,000. Okay, C is the principal loan sum. That means the amount that you borrow. Okay, that's the principal loan sum. Okay, now we have an example here in page 80. Can we go to page 80?
Okay? Right. In page 80, we have this Peter employed as the chief accountant of ABC, a public listed company, and Peter was given a loan, 500000 to finance his expenses. Now, the loan was taken by ABC from Hong Leong Bank. So they, they told us that the loan is external. Okay? They're using external fund. Right, then uh, in case one, Peter used that loan to buy a residential house. It's a second house. It's actually not important. Okay, and the balance of the loan at the end of the year is four hundred and fifty thousand, and ABC subsidizes thirty percent of the cost. Now, how much is the subsidized interest? You know, when you want to work out the amount you want to tax in thirteen one A, right? How much is the subsidized interest? Now, the subsidy is 30% of 60,000. That means your boss subsidized 18,000 for you. Okay, so your boss is subsidized. 18,000 for you. Now, and, and then, you get an exemption, you see. Alright? Because the loan used for buying a house, so you get an exemption. So the, the question now is, how much is the exemption? Now, because the loan is already more than 300,000, you have to use the formula. Now, the formula is A. A is 18,000. Because A is what? Subsidized interest. So, A is 18,000. Multiply with B over C. What is B again? Lower of 300 or the loan balance. Now, what is the loan balance? Now, they say that the loan balance is 450. So in that case, B will have to be 300. The lower figure. And C is the amount you borrow, which is 500. So you see, in that case, uh, you actually have 18,000 times 3, 5. Now, the exemption is 10,008. So you've got 7,002. Okay, now I would like you to try case 2 and case 3. It's just a quick one. Just work out how much is the figure that you're going to assess.
Okay. Peter used a loan to pay for his son's overseas education. Now, in that case, uh, you, you won't have actually an exemption that you right? Now, the loan balance at the end of the year is 400000 He has to pay back 20000 Question now is, what is the subsidized interest? Now, the subsidized interest will be 60 minus out the 20, right? So, it's actually 40000 now, and there's no exemption here because the purpose of the loan is not for the three reasons that we know. So the amount is 40k. Now, in the third case, right, they say that uh, Peter used a loan to finance his new BMW. He's buying a car. And then the loan balance at the end of the year is 280000 And ABC has imposed an interest of 18000 for the loan given to Peter. Now, this is for a car, which exemption is given. So again, what is the interest subsidy? Now, the interest is 18. So 60,000 minus 18, meaning you have been subsidized for the 2,000. And then we're going to use the same ABC formula now. So the ABC formula will be 42 times. Now, what is the figure up there for B? Now, this time, they say the loan balance is 280. So, that's the lower amount. So, we're going to use 280 and then over 500. Is it 500? Yeah, 500. So, what is the amount that we're going to have for the, the exemption? So, 2850, uh, we get... Twenty three thousand five twenty. So then the amount is what you assess to tax. Okay. All right. Uh, that's on the subsidized interest. Now uh, just a bit more. Okay. We have also gift vouchers. Now these must be vouchers that they have money's worth, meaning it's worth money. Like I give you a, a voucher. For Paxson, you, you know, you can go Paxson, do shopping, and you pay. That's the voucher. So the value on the voucher is what we tax. So if you got a voucher that is, let's say, 100 ringgit, then you tax 100 ringgit. Is it not? Okay. Now, and uh, you might also get gifts of assets, all right? Now, gifts of assets basically means you've got some free assets from, from bosses, you know, like watches, Jewelry is it's quite common, you know. Some companies encourage staff to work long. Huh? You say like uh, first five year you probably get a tech for year, and then ten year get an Omega watch, fifteen year get a Rolex. You, you know that kind of thing is to encourage you to stay on. Now, so you might get watches for any reason, and watches or, or any kind of asset. It's not just watches. Whether computer is the same. You know, a lot of company they will they will tell their staff. You know, you're given a laptop. After three years, the laptop is yours. Then they get a new laptop. So at least the old laptop, you, you, you can take it and use it with anything you like. Okay. Now, so when they have things like that, the gifts will actually be convertible to cash. Okay. Gifts are actually convertible to cash. You can sell it away for cash. So you have to tax it. All right. You have to tax it. Now, but when you tax the gift, take note now. You must tax using what? The market value of the asset. Okay? See, like just now I say, uh, companies that say, now I'm going to give you a laptop for you to use for the work. Three years later, is yours. Now, that means it's not yours yet. That's why usually company have policy like if you have if lost a laptop anytime in three years, you have to pay back X amount of money. But after three years, they, they find that the laptop has no value value So that's why most of the time company just give you the laptop after three years. Now then you must take for the third year when you get the laptop, what's the value of the laptop? So if the laptop worth three hundred ringgit, that's the value. You're gonna use three hundred tax stuff. Now, but you have to take note now. Uh, because earlier we mentioned that exemption is applicable for the utility. So the exemption covers the asset. That's why you get exemption for the telephone, which I don't think anything great to shout. Lah. I mean, you get a telephone, I mean, what's the value, right? Okay. 
But mobile phone is quite different. If you get a mobile phone, the value can be quite high. You know, I, I can give you an Apple phone, which is like 6,000 ringgit, for example. So I can give you a very expensive phone, which will still be exempted. Now, and a pager will also be exempted. Now, that, that's all, okay? There is no exemption, all right? There's no exemption for personal computer. Because a lot of people thought that computer is all together with all these things. No, computer got no exemption, okay? Now, you do have exemption, okay? You do get exemption if it is associated with awards. Alright? You do get exemption if it's associated with awards. Now, that will actually be in page 82. Okay? Page 82. Which, can I just come to page 82, a quick one? Uh, I put here... Perquisite in relation to service award. Now, may maybe you should just write down this is an exemption. Alright, this is an exemption. So, what happened here? If you get an exemption for long service, past achievement, service excellence, innovation, productivity, you, if you have all these things, award lah. You, you know, award can come in many examples. You, you know, some company they actually encourage the staff to be punctual. Lah. They say if you don't come late throughout the whole month, we get extra hundred ringgit. So it's actually an award. So the, the side wow, so I, I just be punctual for the whole month, I get extra hundred ringgit. Now, what, what can you do with 100 ringgit is you get an exemption because for award is given an exemption up to 2,000 ringgit a year. So if every month, the whole month, you, you, you are punctual, you get 1,002. It's exempted. Now, if let's say you, you get an award, like for example, you're the best performing employee of the month. So being the best employee, company say you're going to get a watch. It's exempted up to 2,000. Okay. Now, the only thing I must highlight to you is because I get example, like you work for five years, you get something, ten years, you get something. Now, the only thing I must highlight is this. If it's a long service award, now, there's an additional condition. Is long service award exemption is provided you have exercised employment for more than ten years. If it's not ten years, you don't get exemption. Understand? You still need the ten year requirement to get the award. Alright, okay, so uh, I've covered quite a number of 13.1a items, so uh, maybe you just take a short break, then we'll come back after the break and carry on. Okay, hey, what are you doing here? So, what? Voila, like that. I pressure there. Hey, see that, see that, Brendan, see that? You're welcome. Okay, do anything you like, disturb the girls. Surely be so excited, see? No, ah. I'm very open one, right? College is the place where you start to build relationship. Any kind of relationship. Just don't over, just don't overbuild only. Oi, chapo la, chicken now are you? Okay, see you again. Bye-bye. Huh? Okay, uh, let's go back to page 80 and uh, look at... Now, we're still in 13.1a. Uh, basically, it's telling us about scholarship. And remember, I've told you this now, when your boss is paying for your children's education, it's very different when your boss say, I pay for your children's education, compared with your boss say, I pay for your study. Because when your boss says, I'll pay for your study, it's actually a scholarship. And scholarship is already tax exempt under the law. Because we have this provision in Schedule 6, Paragraph 24, 
that basically says that exemption is given for anything in the nature of scholarship given to that individual, whether or not that's in connection with employment. See, it doesn't matter whether it's employed or not. That means if I grant you a scholarship directly, even though you're not my staff, it will still be tax exempt. Now, uh, but I want you to be very clear here because uh, most employer, right, they don't grant scholarship to the staff because when they when they give scholarship, they know that scholarship is a free gift. It's a money that I give it to you. What happened after you got scholarship three months later, you resign? The money is gone, you know. It's the scholarship, okay? Now, so what most employer will do is most employer will tell you, I'll give you a loan to study. But the thing is, uh, if you work with me for X number of years, then this loan, we waived it. You don't have to pay. Just like what uh, this uh, Price Waterhouse is, is, is doing. And a lot of our students actually, actually went there and, and took up a scheme like that where uh, you can work with them and they will give you, I, I can't remember how much, uh, twenty or 30000 Then after that, uh, you must work with them for I think two years or three years and they will waive the amount. If you don't, when you resign, you have to pay back the money. So actually it's a loan. If you really think of something like that, actually it's better you apply this thing called M Corp Grant. I don't know whether you heard of this or not. If not, you just Google M Corp Grant. Uh, a few of our students has got it. Okay, one, in fact, one that just graduated uh, last exam, Jia En. Okay, you can see we do the interview video with her. She told about how she got it and so on. It's a lot of money, you know. They give uh, 50000 free cash give to you. Of course, they don't give you one shot 50000 okay? Uh, there are some requirements, like you cannot fail the paper. And then uh, you, you need to, like, pass. I don't, I don't know whether you need to maintain the marks or not, but definitely you cannot fail the paper. That's one of the requirements. Then after that, uh, you got 50000 you got 50,000 free plus, you get 20,000 loan. So they give it all together 70,000. The 20,000 is a loan with very low interest. Then once you graduate, you work with M Bank, I mean, not M Bank, like the M, M Corporation, like, which they have quite a big group for minimum three years. So you look at it, it's a good thing because the economy is bad, you got free money, you got low interest rate loan, and you don't have to worry for no job. The moment you come up, you work. But of course, the salary is a bit low. La. You, you, you compare with, like if you work in a firm, you probably get about two, uh, 3003 That's how you start. Okay. But if you work with M, M Bank, for example, you probably start around 2008 But if you work out and see, uh, 500 different, plus your EPF is another 50. It's about 500 to 600 different. 600 different, you times 12 is how much? Uh? Uh, 7,002. So you times three years, it's about 20,000. So it's basically you, you, you take the money first, uh, but you still get extra money because you got 50k. Huh? Can consider, okay? Now, uh, but sorry, come back to this. Uh. So the whole idea about waiver of loan is if your boss give you a loan, not a scholarship, then, the, then you have to tax it. Because the exemption is very clear. Exemption is for scholarship. So if you get a loan and later on your boss waived it, you tax it. Now, I'm having a simple example here which is quite clear. Okay, Gwen works with a legal firm in February 2016. The employer gave her a loan, 20000 to enable her to attend a one-year course in law. So she, she was given a loan, 20000 Now, the loan contract provides that if Gwen works with the employer for a period of 24 months, then the loan need not be repaid. See that? So the term is such that if you join and continue for 24 months, the loan need not be repaid. So that's a waiver. That's not a scholarship. Okay? Now, Gwen successfully fulfilled the condition of the contract in January 2019. January 2019, and now loan was waived. So what do you do? 
you will have to use that 20,000 as a perquisite and put it as part of your employment income and you put it in year of assessment 2019. Now, why 2019? Because that's the year where loan is waived. That means when the loan is waived, that's where you derive the benefit. Okay, clear? Now, no tax is a scholarship, but this is not a scholarship. This is a waiver of loan. Okay, earlier before the break, we see about free gift or assets given to you is taxable. Now, if you don't get it as a free asset, but you get it at the discounted price, it's actually the same treatment. The asset sold to you at discount, the value of the discount given is actually a perquisite which is taxable. So it's quite clear, again, example here like FRB bought a car for 160000 Now on 1st Jan 2019, the car sold to Meridian for 40 k when the market value on that day determined to be seventy five. So what do you do? Now if Meridian is going to buy the car himself, He's going to pay 75000 But he only pay how much? 40. So, you expect 13.1A, the discounted value of the car is 35, and you tax it. Okay? It's quite clear, right? Yeah. Now, and uh, take note that you may not just get discount on asset. You also can get discount if it's to do with stocks. Now, but, but stocks can be a bit tricky la, because uh, it can be in a form of products that you buy where you can actually sell it back. It can also in the form of services. Example, uh, if let's say you work uh, with, with MCKL and then you wanted to to pursue study and then you want to sign up a course here and then being a staff, they say, okay, we give you a 50% discount. Now that, that's a discount on the service. All right. Now when you have a discount on the service, you, you realize that it falls here. Okay. Now, and there's a problem, you must be very clear because a lot of uh, companies out there, right, they, they, don't, they don't work within a company. Because usually it's a group. Now, I get example. Let's, let's say uh, may, maybe you're working with Taylor's group. Now, I don't know their structure. I'm, I'm just giving an example, okay? So probably Taylor University belongs to one company. Then Taylor got school, right? Maybe international school belongs to another company. So which, which I think quite logical. Most people do like that. Like they structure their companies into different units to handle different levels. So if you are a staff with... Taylor University. Then your son go to Taylor International School. And your boss say, because you're working with a group, I'll give you a discount. I'll give you 80% discount. So your son go to international school, let's say you get a discount, 50,000. Is it a discount that we're saying here? It's not, you know. Because they don't fall in the same company. If, if you are working in the same company, of course, it's a discount because it's my product. But you are now going to another company and I'm basically paying for you for the discount. I mean, even though you can say it's like same group, but from the point of view of tax, they are not the same group. That's why all these are examples of things that you, you do have to take note. Now, okay? That's the reason why uh, sometimes people, they don't understand and they'll say that, hey, how come I got to pay tax for all these things? I thought... Uh, it's, it's, it's considered as a discount and so on, but you don't belong to the same company. You're a different group, okay? So remember, it has to be in the same company, okay? Now, I'm giving an example here. I, I say Jocelyn is now employed by a company called Club 21, September. Huh? Now, as a staff, right, she can buy handbag at a discounted price. So the handbag actually is 7,000 ringgit. But she only need to pay a staff price of 3,000 ringgit. So she saved 4,000, okay, no? Now, so this 4,000 is a perquisite because of the saving that she got. Now, and, and we treat this 4,000 as 13.1A because the handbag, right, you can sell it. Am I right? 
which, which in fact a lot of people are doing that. I have a friend those days who work in coach and used to ask me if you want to buy anything, he can buy for me at a huge discount. He just want to take 5% on me, he said. He just asked me to buy. So he just buy for me and then he'll pay 5%. But I said, I'm a man, I, I don't need a handbag. You know, so it's okay, all right. Now, so, but most people, when they have this kind of advantage, right, they, they do that, they buy at discounted price, then they sell back to people slightly higher and make profit. So the, the value or the discount is convertible to cash. See that? Now, but we have exemption. We have exemption. So there is an exemption given up to 1,000 ringgit. Now, take note of these two. Uh, this one and this one. Uh. In order to enjoy the 1,000 ringgit exemption, it has to be your product. You're selling that product. See, I'm selling handbags. See that? I'm selling handbags. You're buying the handbag at a discounted price. The discount got exemption. Okay? Discount exemption. Now, but in, in my office, we got a lot of computers. And, and I'm going to sell the computers away for a discounted price. Now, that, that computer, no exemption because that's not my stock. You see the difference? Huh? It must be stock. If it's not stock, there's no exemption. This 1,000 exemption is given because they are trading stock. Okay? Now, later we'll see this again in 13.1b. All right. All uh, right. Next is about credit card facilities. Now, if, if let's say your, your boss, so nice, give you a credit card, and, and, then, and then your boss say that, uh, just use the credit card as you wish. Okay, you, you can use a credit card to buy anything you like. For example, they say you can use a credit card, okay, for private purchases. Okay, the card belongs to the company and then use the credit card to buy anything you like. And, and the company will actually say, I will settle the bill for you. Wow, nice or not? This are, is our are company. Can fire. Can fire. Cannot. Uh, company where God. Uh, but you become prime minister, can. That's why we have a credit card used to buy handbag, alright? Then we also have uh, a deputy prime minister that he issued a check to settle his personal credit card bill. So that's why job don't have one. Ministers got, okay? Now, we're jokingly saying on here. Now, so all, all these are the, the things that we see here. Because credit card is actually money. Am I right? You're using it to spend. It's actually money. So when bosses is settling the card for you, that amount is taxable. That's it, okay? Now, please turn to page 82. Now, uh, let's look at this thing called professional subscription. Now, we are referring to people like, example, like, let's just like ourselves, accountant. Okay, you know, if you become ACCA, you know, if you become ACCA every year, you must pay membership fee, right? Do you know how much I'm paying every year? Just, just for you to roughly guess. How much you are paying every year? 400 plus, right? Uh, about 500, right? I'm paying about 1,003 to 1,004. Mm. Don't worry, your time will come. Alright? But, but it's okay. La. Usually we say that by the time when you pay that, you have the cap capability to earn back. La. But that's why the pain of being a professional is that, that you have to keep on paying. So I've been paying for 20 over years. Already. So if you, if you add up, Realize that it's actually about not cheap, you know, about twenty over thousand that you have to pay. And I think I will not die so soon, so probably I will continue to pay another 20 30 years. All right, so then you end up you realize that the, the professional is not cheap, also. A, a lot of people say it's cheap, yeah, it's cheap, lah, but you know, the hidden cost is not cheap when you pay every year, then you know it's not cheap. Okay, now, uh, back to this. So, the, the professional subscription is quite tricky because. If, if I'm an ACCA, for example, and sometimes my boss might come to me and tell me, hey, since you're an accountant right, and, and this subscription, we pay for you. So boss may choose to pay for me, all right? Now, or, or I may have a case that my boss is not paying for me and I'm paying myself. So it's quite tricky. So I'll see that next time, that if you pay yourself, what do you do? If your boss is paying for you, what do you do? 
Now, so this is the one that your boss is paying for you. So your boss is paying on behalf. Okay, your boss is paying on behalf. Now, it will not be a perquisite. The way it's not, eh? meaning it's not taxable. All right, it will not be a perquisite, so it's not taxable. Condition is what? Condition is if you need the staff, the knowledge of his profession to carry out his work. Now, that's why the keyword I'm just going to highlight here when the membership is relevant to the business. Okay, now, the, the easiest example is to look at ourselves. Now, if let's say you're employed as an accountant, okay? Now, your boss is paying your ACCA membership fees. Now, because of your position as an accountant, then the ACCA fees that your boss pay is not taxable. E even though you actually save the money, you realize that? You save the, the, the professional membership fee, but you don't have to tax it because the membership is relevant to the business of your employer. But if, if let's say, for example, if let's say you're not employed as an accountant, let, let's say you're employed as a marketing manager, and your job does not involve your accounting skill. It doesn't need the qualification in the first place. Then your boss is paying your ACCA fee. Now, in that case, uh, this is taxable. And this is not taxable. Okay, so it's important to see if what you're doing is relevant to the job. If it's not relevant, no. Okay? Clear? Now let's just come down and look at the next one. Uh, this is a very small thing. Uh, it's quite old uh, because now we don't even have the, the word called LAN anymore. Now the word LAN has been replaced by MQA. Okay? Th those days it's called LAN. Alright? Now it's called MQA. Uh, you, you know, basically, as, as uh, colleges, right, before they can run or offer any courses, they must get the, the course approved by MQA. Okay, that, that's our duty. So if you run courses without MQA, uh, it, it's actually illegal. Uh, that's why we must run MQA. So, so like, you ask the questions, uh, why do I do MPU? You, you know... I'm an ACCA, what is there for me to learn all that MPU subjects? You, you don't really like that, you know, I, I don't like that as well. Okay, if, if you ask me, I, I say if I can, I get you don't do it. Probably you don't need it, but of course some of the MPU subjects are quite good, lah, okay? Uh, but, but because we are under MQA, you have to follow the rules. Lah. That's why if you happen to do ACCA on cell study mode, you don't have to do all these MPU. Lah. Because ACCA don't have MPU, but because of MQA, we need you to do the MPU. You see, no? So that, that's the reason. That's the rationale. All right? Now, so we got to see this. You know, when MPU, uh, so MQA go to, to colleges to make, to approve courses, right? They must be able to understand the course content and the course detail. You, know, you, you can't be expert to know everything, you see. So let's say, for example, now uh, MCK, I want to run a course on aerospace. So we design a course on aerospace. So all the documents are there. Then MQ is supposed to come and check us. You think M M MQ people will know all these aerospace? They won't know what. So what they'll do? They will invite lecturers from Unisty's example that offer this kind of program to come and help MQA to run through all the document and see whether you're doing it properly or not. Now, that's why it says here, 
that when they invite lecturer or expert, now although those days it's called LAN, now it's called MQA, they are invited by MQA to help them to do validation, moderation, accreditation, that kind of thing, for higher education. But you know the government call them, they don't just call them one, they pay them one. So when they pay for their service, the fees that you get will be tax exempt. Small thing, all right? But on and off, you see that coming on the exam, okay? Okay, uh, let's just come to one last one here called inducement payment. Now, uh, what is an inducement payment? Now, inducement payment is basically a payment made to a person to jump ship. You know, today, this last two days is where we talk about fraud jumping here and there right? because of our politics. So that's exactly what we're saying. You know, um, you're so good in your job and a competitor company notice you and, and would like to take you over. All right, I, I remember how Apple uh, wanted to do their Apple car project. But Apple, you know, they, they never deal with cars. One. So when they wanted to start Apple car, they need people that has a skill. So who did Apple offer? Apple may offer huge increment and huge benefit to the worker from which company? Famous one that deal with car, Tesla. All right. So Apple made a lot of offer to Tesla and say that, hey, you all join Apple and, and start on our Apple car project. But, but of course, a lot of them didn't join. Okay? So although Apple offer, they didn't cross over. Now, but this is the idea that I'm saying. People make an offer for you to cross over. So imagine you are you, you're a worker with Hong Leong Bank. And now Public Bank is interested to bring you over and say, come, I'm, I'm going to first give you 500000 If you just agree to say yes. You're going to get it, 500000 Now, that, that 500000 is what we call inducement payment. So, question is, do I have to pay tax on this amount? Now, the answer is no. Okay? Inducement payment is not taxable. So it's a good thing for you, okay? That you get a huge amount and you don't have to worry about paying taxes. All right? Okay, so uh, I basically finish off things that's under 13.1a. So it's a lot, right? Okay? Now, let's just move on to 13.1b. Okay. Now, what is 13.1b again? Now, we say this is about enjoyment of benefit. Okay? It's to do with enjoyment of benefit. Now, and we always have these issues like if you really have enjoy a benefit, question then is how do you ascertain the value? What is the value of the benefit that I've enjoyed? Okay, like if your boss say, nah, that's the car key. You, you drive the car home and you can drive this car for the rest of the year. Now, I've been driving the car. So what's the value of the car? So how do you determine? Now, we have said this before, but I'm just going to come in and, and start look at this in detail. Now, whenever you are given a benefit, you can determine the value of the benefit either through a method called prescribed value or formula. There's two methods, PV or formula. Okay? Now, only selected BIK has PV. Okay? That, that's very important. Alright? Now, uh, not all benefit has a PV. Okay? Only selected benefit has a PV. I'll come to that later. Now, when you don't have PV, you don't have a choice. Huh? You have to use formula. No choice, okay? So, for BIK without PV, you must use 
formula. Uh, what what do you mean by PV? What what does prescribed mean? Is given. The value has already been given. That's why it's a prescribed value. It's like a prescription like that. It's prescribed to you. Okay? It's given to you. So you don't have a choice. Just follow the value. For example, when you are given a mate, okay? If your boss says, come, I'm, I'm giving you a mate. The value of a mate is always 400 ringgit. I don't care how much you're paying the mate. It will always be taken to be 400. Is it? Why? Because the value is prescribed. Is fixed okay now so PV means the value given by IRB is fixed so the actual cost is not used okay PV is given by IRB so the actual cost is not used. Now, the PV is provided in your exam question. And then, by default, we use PV. Okay, so by default, will use PV. So you expect questions will not actually tell you. Alright, question will not actually tell you what is the, the PV, whether you're going to use or not, but you will use it automatically. That, that's what we say. Alright, so by default, that's what we do. We'll use PV. Okay, uh, where will the PV be given? Now, if you just go to the front page, right? You notice that this is where the prescribed value is actually given. Now, a uh, second page. Huh? You see, they mention the value of benefit in kind. See or not? Now, that, that's the PV. Now, see, the car or the motor vehicle with benefit. See, notice they say the prescribed annual value is prescribed to you for the car. The prescribed annual value for the petrol so is given. One. You just read from this table. And then if you go on to the next page, uh, all right, it goes on the next page, you notice they also tell us that if you are given a driver, the value is 600 a month. See, the driver is mentioned. Now, then there are also other benefits, which include household furnishing. They are talking about furniture which I will run through all that with you when, when we come to that. Now then, they also mention domestic help, which is your servant and gardener, which is 400, 300 per month. So I, I don't have to worry about remembering the PV because the value is all there, okay? Now let, let's go down to, go back to the note just now. Okay. So what are the... PV that they, they give it to us car petrol driver furniture the servant gardener Okay, these are the benefit that PV is actually given. All right, these are the benefit that PV is actually given. All right, okay, now, so carry on now. When you have formula, what is formula? Now, why call it formula? So it gives us an impression there's a formula I need to follow. Now, actually, it's not quite, la, okay? Formula means the BIK value will follow the actual cost of the BIK. Okay, the BIK value is the actual cost of the BIK.
Okay. Now then, then the second thing is some of your benefit, right? They are actually asset, and because they are asset, the cost of their asset it's something that it will be usable for a long period of time. Now, because the life of the asset is long, it, it becomes strange if you take the cost. Now, example, right? If let's say your boss say, come, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, a piano for you to use at home. So your boss spends 60000 to buy a piano. So are, are you going to take 60000 and tax me? But then you ask yourself, does a piano use and throw one? After one year, you, you throw no, right? The piano lasts many, many years, you know. So that's why... You cannot just use 60,000 and tax me. Now, that is why it's called formula. So the formula is telling us that the annual value of the BIK is usually the cost of the asset divided by the prescribed life. Okay? The cost of the asset divided by the prescribed life. Okay, the life is not given, okay, uh, in the exam table. That's why just now when we go through a table, it's not given. But normally, if they want to test you in the exam question, they will tell you in the question. So far, okay. Uh, you can have a look at page 86. So page 86 is where the prescribed life is given, okay. So just a quick one, uh, okay, go to page 86. Now, uh, that's the prescribed life. So when your boss give you, like I say, a piano, right? The life of a piano is prescribed to be 20 years. So the cost of the piano, if it's 60,000, you take 60,000 divided by 20. That means the value of the piano is 3,000 a year. We use that and put it inside your tax comp. Now, that, that's the prescribed life. But this thing is quite outdated. It's a it's a olden day things are when things are so old fashioned those days. There are a lot of things you cannot see here man. That's why they still use the word color TV. Because those day TV got color and black and white. That's why it's called color TV. They don't know what is called L C D TV. Those days where got L C D one. Because you're not so now I ask you if you got very advanced things it's not listed here. Like if you get a PS4 which category that it falls under? Yeah, but which one? You get a, a treadmill at home. Your boss give you a house that inside got a treadmill. The value of treadmill is 30,000, advanced treadmill. Okay, which one? Recreation. <laughs> Or what? Furniture. Call as what? Refrigerator. It helps you to cool down your body because you sweat. Alright? So, so you, you notice that this, this is quite old-fashioned, you know. So they should have come up with a, a better list. Lah. But of course, you know, to them it's not so important because it's not something like they will come across very often in real life. Okay. So that, that, that's the main thing we're going to see. Now, so how different will it be if I'm going to use PV and I'm going to use formula? Now, before I actually go through one by one, I want to summarize this with you. And I will come back and explain this. Because if not, chances you probably will not link what I say. You can, cannot gel in. Now, whichever method that you're using, you're allowed to do time apportionment. Okay? You're allowed to do time apportionment. All right. Now, you're allowed to do apportionment even if you need to share the benefit. Fine, you, you can. Both methods allows that. But the main difference is when you use PV method, you will not have apportionment for usage and you will not get an expense deduction. Now, I'll come to this when I do the example. I'll remind that to you. 
okay? Usage or expense. But you are allowed to do apportionment for usage if you're using formula, and you're allowed to do deduction if you're using formula. So that, that's quite a vast difference that we see here and there, okay? Now, let's start with the first one. Okay, can I first discuss with you the BIK table for motor vehicle? Because that's the only one that we need to read through in detail, okay? Okay, uh, for motor vehicle, right? If your boss gives you a vehicle, now, take note, huh? First thing is, you must ask yourself, what is the cause of the car? Okay, what is the cause of the car? Now, put a question mark about what cause actually means. Now, cause of the car is the value of the car, which include accessory, but exclude interest, insurance, rotax. Now, it must be when the car is new. Okay? It has to be when the car is new. Alright? Now, you, you know, if you buy a car, for example, uh, you realize that the car usually comes with accessory. You, you'll be thinking like, what is it? You know, aircon is accessories. Alright? Like, or you want your car to have a sport stream. These are all examples of accessories. Now, that's part of the value of the car. Now, if, if you walk into a, you know, any showroom and say you want to buy a car, right? They normally tell you the on the road price. ODR, on the road. On the road means when the car is ready for you to drive on the road. That means you must have what? Insurance and road tax. Because these two things you don't have, you cannot drive the car on the road. So everything, registration, all the costs inside. That's why the price of the car could be 90000 But the on the road price could be 95000 a day. Because you have to pay for all that kind of thing. No, but when we take the value, we only take the car, the accessory, we will not take insurance, we will take, not take road tax and interest. They are not added to the car. Now, so what you do is you just read the value of the car when it's new. Just read the value of the car. What is it? Based on the range. Now, if, if let's say you are given a Honda Accord, the price is $180,000, let us say. Now, then you just come here. And then you say, okay, 180,000 is here. Then you just read the value of the car. Now, it's annual, right? It's one year, 7,000. Okay? The value of the car is 7,000. Now, if your boss say that the car comes with petrol, that means they're pumping petrol for you for free. Right? They pay for the petrol. Now, then you continue to add 1,008. That's all. Simple, right? Just look at the value. Pick it up. Okay? And, and, and you see, it's so much cheaper. No? Your car, 180000 you know. And you only tax 7000 a year. Only. It's really cheap. Okay? Now, if you come down, it, it, it's actually say here that if your car is more than five years old, eh, the value that you're going to use for car will actually be half. That means this column... Eh, it will be half. Okay? Now, only the car value half. The petrol will not. Which makes sense, right? Do you, do, you, do you see the logic why they have the car value? Because when car is older, the value of the car goes down, right? Will, will old car use less petrol? Imagine you sold old until don't need petrol. Eh? No such thing. Man. So that's why... The petrol consumption is the same. That's why this part, no adjustment. So we only adjust the car value. I think it's quite clear. And it's actually mentioned very clearly in the BIK table. So you should not miss all that. Now, then you have to understand that uh, when you're using this table for petrol, there's no more exemption 6,000 a day. Because in case you're thinking of the traveling allowance with a 6,000 exemption, can I claim exemption here? No. 
the moment you use this, the exemption doesn't apply to you anymore. All right? Now, so the 6,000 doesn't apply. Okay, so now we know the value for car, value for petrol. Now, the formula method for car is not in the syllabus anymore. So I put not in the syllabus, so I, I won't discuss with you. Okay, if you get a driver, right, driver is at 600 a month. But if you get, if you're going to use formula method, then you just use the actual salary of the driver, which then cannot be 600. What, what, what would be the salary of driver be? What do you think it will be? If you pay 1,005 for a driver, you dare to use a driver or not? He drive, 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 don't know, bring you to which country. Maybe it's one drive, you reach Holland. That you, you know. So that's why driver is not cheap. A, a lot of people employ driver together as a security guard. I mean, not, I mean, their personal guard, I don't say security, it's a personal guard. Because a lot of rich people need a guard, man. so they hire their driver, and that driver is a guard. And a really good one can cost you four, five thousand. No joke, one, because you know, okay? These are the people that if people take gun and shoot bullet, the person will block the bullet for you, one. You will do that, no? You won't, one. So that's why they, they are more professionally trained. So that, that's why it's not cheap. But you see, from tax, we only tax 600, and it's so cheap. Now, that, that's the main difference. Now, if you're given a servant, right, the value of servant is 400 a month. Again, it's so cheap. You know what's the actual cost of servant nowadays? Huh? You get a Philippine maid, it's 1,007. All right? 1,007. That's why you become a maid, you can save more money. You think and see, uh, if you work, uh, for example, uh, you work, uh, you come out and become accountant in the big four, you start with 3,003 a month. If you stay yourself, don't say stay with your parent, you stay yourself, you spend yourself, use your own expenses, can you save 1,007 a month? Cannot one, you're 3,003 harbis. Nothing left. Uh, that's why it becomes a bit better, right? At least you can save 1,007, alright? Uh, that, that, that's why people actually become a mate because they can save money since they don't have to pay for their living costs, they have to pay for all these expenses. They just take all the amount they have, okay? Now, anyway, we are seeing from tax, made is tax at 400 a month. Now, come to gardener, next page, gardener. Now, gardener is tax at 300 a month, all right? And nowadays, people don't use gardener, all right? Because made become the gardener also, okay? Now, furniture. Okay, furniture, it's meant for those cases when employee is given a house, now, house is 13.1c. It's a different section that we're going to take tax, okay? Okay. But if the house has furnishing, all right, if the house is furnishing, now then this is benefit in kind. Which, of course, you have to tax under 13.1b. So now we have to come to the issue then, what is the, the value of your furnishing? Okay, so the value of the furnishings are divided into three levels. It's either fully furnished or semi-furnished. Now, to us, semi is actually divided in this level. Now, if you start off with lounge, dining, bedroom. So imagine that uh, what you have is like sofa, a sofa, coffee table, then uh, a dining table, all right? Then you go to your bedroom, you got a bed set and cabinet. That's it. That's the most basic furnishing. Now, that will be seven, 70 ringgit a month. That's how we assess it. Now, if you have what we just said, plus aircon, curtain, or carpet, any one of these. Say one of the window you go in got one curtain. Then you, you suddenly have to be taxed additional 70 ringgit a month. So you better tell the boss take away the curtain. Honestly, you know. I mean, if you just see one window like that got one curtain. All right? Just because of one piece of thing like that, you know, you'll be taxed extra 70 a month, which is 840 a year. 
If that one piece is only cost 200 ringgit, might as well you ask your boss to throw away. Hey, take back our boss, I don't want. Then you buy yourself and fix. Then you tax lesser. Because the value goes up by double. Okay? Now, the third level of furnishing is when you have everything in the first, second level plus, you also get kitchen equipment. Like if you have a hood, for example, all right, kitchen cabinet, now that's kitchen equipment. Then the value becomes double again to 280 a month. Now, you must understand uh, when we say furnishing, you know our mindset of furnishing is everything in the house, which is not the mindset of the law. The mindset of the law is we only talk about exactly what we say here, like sofa, okay, the bed, the dining table, the aircon. Now, anything beyond that is not furnishing. Now, example, uh, you open up the house, you enter, your boss said you stay in the house, you enter and you saw the sofa, is that? then you saw a TV. That TV is not furniture. The TV is an additional asset that you have in the house. Now, that's why we say just now, when you have something that you don't have TV, right? What must you do? Formula? So, example, eh? example, your boss give you a house, the house got air con, okay, air con, and then got dining table, alright, got sofa, okay, and then they put TV here, and then this is your bedroom. Now, this house, the furniture you get is 140 a month because got air con. But because the house has a TV, then that TV, you have to work out the additional value. Now, what's the value of the TV? So, your boss gives you a super big, big TV one. You can see not, that the dinosaur can come out from the TV one. So, the TV costs 30000 Now, then you take 30000 Now, if you follow the, the prescribed life in page 86, huh? TV is... Seven years, okay, 35 lah, huh? Because 30 very hard to calculate. So you divide by seven. That means you expect the TV is taxed 5,000 ringgit a month, you know. As a, a year, you know. So you expect this furniture will be 140 times 12, plus you need to add another 5,000 because of the TV. That's why all these additional things in the house, if it's not covered under furnishing, you actually have to pay on extra for it. That's why you say the TV must work out the value. If you got PS4, must work out the value. You got treadmill, must work out the value. So all these things have to be top up. Okay? Because furniture doesn't mean everything in the house. That's all we have. Okay? Now, that's why at the bottom, I put here, if you get any other taxable benefit, you just take the value divided by the life. Okay? Okay, go up on top again. Now, remember I've told you about utility earlier, but when we talk about utility, we talk about 13.1a. Now we're talking about 13.1b. So the way we differentiate utility under 13.1b is when they are registered under employer's name. See very carefully. Eh? Now please differentiate this with the one that we discussed just now in the page. 77 so that you don't make a mistake okay now and, and same thing we give you an exemption all right we get an exemption on those utilities just now that we say like telephone mobile phone broadband pager now one each now that then you must be careful so if let's say you have two lines one is your personal name. Okay, let's say your, your mobile phone line. Eh? One is the employer's bill, employer's line. Now, personal name is 131A. Employer's is 131B. Now, you can exam one on it. So you, you then have to ask yourself, which one do you want to be exempted? Do you want your personal line to be exempted? Or the employer's line to be exempted. You choose that. You choose the one that the value is higher. Okay? So that, that's what you must do when it comes to utility. Okay? 
Now, going down to this, now I've highlighted this to you earlier, discounted service. Now, discounted service is B because it cannot be transferred. It's quite different. Now, example, uh, uh, let's say you are a staff with Malaysia Airlines. And then, as a staff in Malaysia Airlines, the company say that, you know, you can buy air ticket at discounted price. So, instead of flying to US, New York, let's say the air, air ticket is supposed to be 6,000 ringgit. But because you're a staff, you only pay 2,000 ringgit. So, you say 4,000. Now, so what do you do with that saving? Now, discounted service is exempted fully. Alright? Discounted service is given full exemption. So the exemption limit 1,000 uh, doesn't apply. Uh. The 1,000 exemption is only for goods, not for service. Why? Because service you cannot transfer. Like you say, uh, I'm going to buy the ticket under my name. Then after that, you go and ask your friend, hey, you want to fly to New York? No, no, I pass you my ticket. You think pass ticket, man? Bus ticket also, they still check your name normally, right? Because, you know, so that's why you cannot just transfer. So it becomes something belongs to you. And you cannot sell away the discount. Not like the bag. You can sell, you get back the money. See the difference, huh? okay? Okay, so we finish off all these things concerning BIK. Now please come to page 86. Now these are the lease of exemption. All right, the lease are exemption that you'll be exempted from for the benefits given. Now, I've highlighted to you for goods, services offered at discount, you'll be exempted. And I've said already, full exemption if it's for service, product, 1000 Okay, now you also get exemption if you get free transport. Now, please don't mix up free transport with car. If I give you a car, you drive the car home. At night, you take the car, go dating. Can you do that? Can is the, the car is with you. Uh. Free transport is, I tell you, every morning, uh, just wait there at the bus stop. At 6 o'clock, there'll be a van come and pick you up. Now, after work, the, the van will send you back, or, or we call uh, bus kilang. That's an example of free transport. That's a different thing. Not car, it's a free transport. Now, if your company or your employer provide you free drinks or free food, you know, in the pantry, got Milo, got biscuit, got buah buahan, all, all that is exempted. Right? Okay? Now, medical, dental, childcare benefit are all exempted. Now, when it comes to medical, take note, eh, they actually give exemption for traditional medicine also. Okay? Maternity also. Now, they include that, but you must be certified, eh? So if you come down from the staircase, you miss a flight, and then you roll down, crock, 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 you break the bone. So you go and see, you say you trust the traditional one. You know traditional, you go to one funny place in the kampong, you find a kong ma like that, then the fellow just take your bone and twist, clack, clack like that. That one not, not, not certified one cannot, you know, there's no exemption one. Okay? You must go for those certified medical practitioners the licensed doctor, that then exemption is given. Now, the exemption is only given when you are going for traditional medicine or maternity. Now, it does not include homeopathy, complementary. For example, uh, you, you know, uh, example like women, after they give birth, they want to go for massage to help them in their body to recover. You see, you know? But that one is under homeopathy or complementary. Or you want to go for aromatherapy. Or you go for what Ayurvedic. All right? These are all not considered as traditional medicine. So there's no exemption. It's not cheap, you know. Or some people with bones, like, like we have back problem, we go for all this chiropractic. People that manipulate your bone, because you know they, they are not considered, so there's no exemption, but they're not cheap. Okay, now uh, group insurance is also given exemption. Now the broadband, the phone line, all that I've explained to you. Now the last thing that we want to see here is actually leave passage. Now leave passage actually refers to your FA. Okay, your boss is giving you a free air ticket, uh, which is a very important 
important benefit uh, if you are working far away from home. So normally, if, let's say, for example, if my boss is going to send me to, for example, to work in, let's say, China. All right? Now, to, to me, I'm going to ask my boss, uh, how many times can I come back to Malaysia? Your boss said, I give you two times. Now, that two times is what? Free, free ticket or I have to pay myself? So, if free ticket, that, that's a passage. There's a lot of time when you, you're, dis, you're required to work far from home. You must ask your boss the leave passage benefit, which is basically the free air ticket. Now, the exemption is given in this way. If the passage is local, you get three times exemption. Three passages will be exempted. The passage is basically the air travel, the booking, all right? So one, one booking. You can book one time with your family one. You can say, I, I and my wife take in the ticket. That's one. You say, I buy one ticket for you, and then a week later, another ticket for your wife. That's two with you because it's separated. The passage goes with per passage. Understand? Huh? You can one passage go with many people. But if you decide to go different time, that, that's different passages. So please understand. Huh? Okay? Now, and for local passage, the exemption can include the cost of the meal and the comp. Three passage. Now, if you go overseas, right? Exemption is only one passage, maximum three thousand. That's the limit. Okay. Now to see whether we understand that. Okay, let's just come to next page. Okay, let's look at case one. Okay. Now Edwin is given a free passage to Singapore with his wife. The value is two thousand eight which include meal and a comp, 800%. Now, if you go with your wife, that's okay, because wife is immediate family. But because this is a passage overseas, so then you realize that the exemption is given on the passage, but not on the meal and comp. Now, so you expect... Okay. Case one... Now, it will be under 13.1b. Now, this will be the overseas leave passage. Now, it's going to cost you 2,000 times 2. And you get an exemption of 3,000. So, the value is, is stacks at 1k. All right? Okay. Then, you notice they mentioned that there will be meal and a comp which will be 800 times 2. Now, there's no exemption on that. Okay? You don't have exemption for meal and a comp. Now, what about case 2? Now, Edwin is now given a free leave passage to Kota Kinabalu with his wife, the value is 3,005 and that's inclusive of meal a comp. Now, this is a local leave passage and it will include meal a comp. I just use M and A. Eh? Now, that will be exempted. See, it's quite straightforward, right? For local, it will be exempted. Okay, case three. Now it says that Edwin is now given free leave passage to Singapore together with his girlfriend Lucy. The value is 2000 Now who is Lucy? Lucy is not his immediate family, all right? Tell that to Lucy. She'll kill Edwin, okay? Now, so... That's an overseas leave passage. 
Now Edwin and Lucy. Now Edwin is 2,000, exam the whole thing because the max is 3,000. But this one, there's no exemption because it's not immediate family. So the benefit can only be exempted if it's given to the immediate family. So in that case, you expect the 2,000 will be assessed. Now, that's case three. Okay, now I've shown you enough example for the first three cases. Right, case four to case seven. Uh, can I get you to just try and just scribble down the value at the side? Then I'll run through the answers with you. Oh, I didn't give you all the attendance. Oh. I realized I didn't bring the attendance. Oh, I'll let you all sign this Saturday. Huh? By the way, we have a class this Saturday. Just to serve you a reminder. Okay. Yeah. Don't look so surprised. Okay. This Saturday is a special Saturday. Only once every four years. Anyone birthday? Yeah? We celebrate together. So, so sad. I must go and ask them to check who, who has birthday on 29. Must reach the person. Just charm once every four years. Okay. Now, case four. Okay, Erwin is now given a free passage to Singapore and Thailand. Now, you see, he's having two passages, Singapore and Thailand. So, in, in, in the case, the exemption... Is only applicable to one of the passage. So what you must do is you take the value which is the highest. 
Now, so for the overseas leave passage, he has a Singapore and Thailand passage. So what you do is you choose either one. Now, of course, I will choose the one that value is 2005. So the one I'll tax is 2002. Okay, case five. Edwin is now given free passage to China or Australia. The value is 35 and 47. Now, this doesn't matter because both also exceeded 3000. You can exempt either one. So the overseas leave passage. Uh, you, you can even do together, all right? But it's always safe to just separate it in the exam so that, you, you know, you don't just, you won't make mistake, lah, okay? Now, 3, 5, if you want to exam here, then the other one you tax, huh? 4, 7. Okay, case 6. Now, Evan is given two passages to Trangano. The value is 1,000. One to Sabah, 1,008. Finally, to Penang. But Penang travel with a brother. The cost is 1,003. Okay, now you see, uh, this is local leave passage. And uh, I, I would show you Edwin and his brother, j just to be clear, okay? Now, there are four passages that he traveled. Trangganu, Trangganu, followed by Sabah and Penang. Now, he has exemption for three, three passages if he's local. Now, which three will, will Edwin be exempted? Now, logically, he should be exempted for the Penang, the Sabah, because these two are the higher value. And then, of course, then we'll take one of the Tringano because it's the same. Now, so you tax the 1,000 because it's already more than three passages. But for the Penang one, right, even though Edwin is exempted, the brother is not exempted because brother is not in media family. So you end up assessing 100,003. Okay? So that, that's how the figure is going to be. Huh? Okay, the last one in case 7. Okay, this time Edwin is given a passage to Langkawi and Korea with his brother as well. The value of the passage is 2004. Include meal com. That's Langkawi, yeah, which is 1,000. Korea is 4,000, include meal account, which is 1,002. Okay. This time, we have Edwin as well as the brother. Now, there's local leave passage, include meal account. The local passage will include meal account. Now, then Edwin is exempted, but the brother's value will be taxable because he is not immediate family. So you expect the 2004 to be assessed. Now then you have overseas leave passage as well as the meal account. Now overseas is only exempted on the passage, not the meal account. So the overseas passage is 2008 for Edwin. Now, his portion is exempted. The brother one is not. So, it's 2008. The male account has no exemption. So, it's 1002 plus 1002. So, it's 2004. Okay? Now, that's the exemption for leave passages, which is basically that's on 131B. So, I think we have one nice section to just stop here. So uh, I'll carry on with the rest this coming Saturday. Okay. Thank you very much. See you. 10 o'clock. Eh? Yeah, 10. 10 to 5.30. Eh? 5.30. Lah. 5.30, 6. Lah, lah. 6.37. Lah, lah. <laughs> Look at the way Shirley stared at me. Eh? Thank you very much.